right. Well, we want to welcome you to the service this morning. I want to kind of set you up just a little bit for the message this morning. And uh, I believe most of you would uh, agree with me that, you know, the Bible encourages us to endure hardness as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. And the implication is that all of us that are believers, we're all soldiers. We're all uh, soldiers of the cross. We're to be enlisted in the Lord's army. And then we're to be engaged in the battle. And uh, we need soldiers. And we need soldiers that are willing to fight. Uh, we need soldiers that are willing to engage in the battle right now. Right now, this very moment. So if I were to ask you today, uh, are you willing and ready to go to war right now? And if I said to you, uh, uh, let me see your hands, if you would raise your hand, if you're willing and ready to go to battle, I, I'm assuming that most everybody in here uh, would raise their hands and say, yes, sir, ready. I'm ready. You can sign me up. I mean, where do we, uh, where do we sign the dotted line and so on? And so most of you would uh, agree that you are ready to go to war, go to battle. But there's one thing that I didn't tell you. And that is that when we go into this battle, when we toll up our army, the number of our army all told is only 300 men. We know that our enemy has a total of 135,000 well-trained, battle-hardened warriors. Now, if I gave you the numbers up front, I'm afraid that might change the attitude of some people. You might not be so willing, so readily willing uh, to get involved in the battle if you knew that we only had 300 men and they have 135,000. Uh, those are truly impossible odds. Some might even look at that and say, well, preacher, that would be a, a suicide mission and that and no doubt would be. Uh, there's no way that an army of 300, no matter how well trained, no matter how battle hardened or savvy they are, 300 men against 135,000, uh, that's just not going to work out. But here's the, here's the thing. You and I have a secret weapon that they don't have, and that is that we have God on our side. So it's impossible odds until we enter into the equation that we have God on our side. Now that's the story that we're going to look at this morning, and you're familiar with this, uh, out of the book of Judges chapter number 7. It's the story of Gideon uh, fighting against uh, the Midianites. And I want us to read just the first eight verses, uh, and then we'll bring the message. The Bible says, Now Jeroboam, who is Gideon, or Jeroboam, who is Gideon, and all the people that were with him rose up early and pitched beside the well Herod, so that the host of the Midianites were on the north side of them by the hill Mori in the valley. And the Lord said unto Gideon, The people that are with thee are too many for me to give the Midianites into your hands. Lest Israel vault themselves against me, saying, Mine own hand has saved me. Now therefore, go to proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, Whosoever is fearful and afraid, let him return and depart early from Mount Gilead. And there return to the people twenty and two thousand, and there remained ten thousand. And the Lord said unto Gideon, the, the people are yet too many. Bring them down into the water, and I will try them for thee there. And it shall be that of whom I say unto thee, this shall go with thee, the same shall go with thee. And whosoever I shall say unto thee, this shall not go with thee, the same shall not go with thee. So he brought down the people under the water, and the Lord said unto Gideon, Everyone that lappeth the water with his tongue as a dog lappeth, thou, him thou shalt set, uh, set by himself. Likewise, everyone that boweth down upon his knees to drink, and the number of them that lapped, putting their hand to their mouth, were 300 men. 
But all the rest of the people bowed down upon their knees to drink water. And the Lord said unto Gideon, By the three hundred men that lapped, will I save you, and deliver the Midianites into thine hand. And let all the other people go every man unto his place. So the people took vittles in their hands and their trumpets, and he sent all the rest of Israel, every man unto his tent, and retained those 300 men. And the host of Midian was beneath them in the valley. We'll leave off the reading there. Let's have a word of prayer, and then we'll go right to the message. Father, thank you for the good word of God again today. And Lord, uh, thank you for who you are we're so thankful for our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. We're thankful for the wonderful gift of the third person of the Godhead, the Holy Spirit who dwells within us. We pray right now, Lord, for his fullness in our heart, in our life, that he would take control. And I pray for everyone that, Lord, listens to this message, that they might yield themselves to you that God, you would give all of us ears to hear and a willing heart to obey. Lord, we thank you for your blessings. We love you so much now. Bless your word, we pray in Jesus' name, amen. Well, this is a, quite a story when we read this, that God is going to uh, defeat the Midianites with a little army of 300 men. And when we read the story, I'm asking myself the question, what is this story really all about? I mean, is it about the 300 men? Is it about Gideon? Uh, or what is it really all about? I, I believe the very theme of the, the whole passage, uh, the theme is, is this. It's, it's about God reducing man's dependence upon himself so that he'll be willing to depend upon God. So let me, let me say that again. I believe that's the, the crux of the message here, that this is about God reducing man's dependence upon himself so that man will have to depend upon God and God alone. It's about man becoming weak so that God can show himself strong on behalf of his own people. If we put it in the words of the Apostle Paul, you remember when uh, uh, he had the thorn in the flesh and he was asking God to take that away, God's answer to him, uh, 2 Corinthians 12, 9, was this. God said to him, my grace is sufficient for thee. And then he made this statement. God says, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Now, when we talk about weakness in our society, that's a, that's a word that we like to shy away from, and especially uh, uh, as men. We don't like to be thought of uh, as weak, and so we, we shy away from that very term uh, of thinking of ourselves weak. If somebody said to me, uh, you know, old Griswold, uh, uh, he's a weak preacher. You know, uh, he, he's a weak leader. He's a weak pastor. Uh, he's a, a very weak Christian. Well, he's just a weakling. That's all we can say about him. Uh, you know, if somebody said that to me or about me, uh, I wouldn't take it as a compliment. Uh, I, I would consider it as uh, an insult. You know, uh, nobody sponsors uh, the weakest man's contest. We like Superman, not the weakest man. We like the strongest man, not the weakest man. We shy away from this idea of weakness. But let me tell you something that is a truth from the Word of God. This is a, a paradoxical truth that uh, we have from the Word of God. And that is, before that you and I can be strong, we have to become weak. The Bible says that before we can be filled, we have to be empty. Before we can be used, we have to be broken. Before we can be helped, we have to become helpless. Before we can become something in the Lord, we have to become nothing of ourselves. We know that in God's economy, the way up 
is down. We know that to gain is to lose. We know that to receive is to give. We know that to be first, we have to be last. We know that to live is to die. We know that before the mountaintop, there always is the valley. And so this whole story that we're reading about this morning, uh, it, it's talking about man becoming weak so that God can show himself strong uh, on uh, man's behalf. It's about God reducing uh, Gideon's strength and his dependence on himself so that God can intervene and God can show himself strong on behalf of his people. Now, I want to look at the, the text this morning uh, uh, in a couple of ways here. The first thing I, I want to look at is the reduction of Gideon's army. The reduction of Gideon's army. There's two reductions uh, that we read about. And I'm going to uh, label them as such. Uh, I'll give it to you here. Uh, first of all, the first reduction is what I'm calling uh, the reduction between the fearful and the fearless. The fearful and uh, the fearless. Now look in verse number two because uh, God says to Gideon, uh, he says that the people that are with me uh, are too many. There's too many, God says. Uh, uh, I can't give you the victory with that many people. There are too many. Uh, and so God wants uh, Gideon, I want you to whittle down uh, the numbers. Now, in order to do this, and I'm assuming that God put this in his heart, but uh, what Gideon does is Gideon invokes uh, God's laws of war found uh, back in the fifth book of our Bible. In Deuteronomy chapter number 20 and verse number 8, uh, here's what the Bible says. The Bible says, What man is there that is fearful and faint-hearted, uh, let him go and return unto his house, he said, lest his brethren's heart faint as well as his heart. So God says, uh, if there's some men that are in your army and they're, they're faint, they're fearful, uh, then uh, we're going to let them return home uh, uh, to their house. Now I want you to use your imagination here and put yourself in the place uh, of Gideon. And I'm sure that, you know, all of these men have responded to Gideon's call. They come, uh, they're ready for battle, so to speak. Uh, and Gideon uh, gets up and he says, I, I appreciate everybody coming. Uh, uh, we're going we're gonna to have this great battle against the Midianites. Uh, but I just want to say right here, right now, uh, if there's any of you that are fearful or faint-hearted, uh, we want you to step aside and go home right now. There's no shame involved in this, uh, but if you are fearful or you're faint-hearted, uh, we want you to go ahead and leave so that you do not discourage the heart uh, of anybody else. And I'm thinking uh, here maybe uh, Gideon thought this. Well, you know, we have all these great warriors here. Maybe uh, two or three hundred are going to say, well, you know, hey, I, I'm, I'm going to head out and go on home back, back home. But we know this, before the dust could even settle, uh, 22,000 said, yep, that's me. Uh, hey, I'm fearful, I'm, I'm afraid, uh, and I'm going to go home. And so uh, uh, 22,000, uh, I mean, uh, when he gave that proclamation, uh, 22,000 said, yep, that's me, uh, and they headed home. 22,000 said, in, in a sense, hey, this is my way out. I'm going home. I, I was thinking about this, and I, I've been in the, the ministry for a long, long time now. I, I, I see a little parallel here in this sense, and that is, uh, you know, in the Lord's work, there's always some in the crowd that are always looking for a way out instead of a way in and uh, you know what? Hey, I, I've been on the way out before. I'm not looking for a way out. I'm looking for a way in uh, where I can be more effective for God. But here it was that 22,000 took the way out uh, and they left. They departed, uh, leaving Gideon now with an army of 10,000. So now we have 10,000 men that are going to go up uh, against 135 
thousand. And, and I, I'm sure, I can almost just imagine uh, uh, Gideon thinking maybe two or three hundred men will go home. Uh, and when 22,000 depart, I'm sure that, that left Gideon scratching his head. And maybe he, he said, hey, I, I, I wasn't looking for that. I didn't expect that. Uh, I didn't see that coming. Uh, but that's exactly what happened. Uh, and 22,000 now have left and has reduced his army down uh, to 10,000 men. Now listen, none of this makes any sense to us. I mean, why would God cut Gideon's army down? None of this makes any sense to us. I know it didn't make any sense to Gideon. We can't understand that because in our thinking and in our culture, we would say this. If you're going to have a strong army, you don't reduce the numbers. You increase the numbers. But alas, as the Bible says in Isaiah 55, 8 and 9, speaking of God, God says, for my thoughts are not your thoughts. Neither are your ways my ways, saith the Lord. For as the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways and my thoughts than your thoughts. It didn't make any sense, but God is doing this for a reason. So he reduces his army down to 10,000 men. That's the first reduction, 22,000 Depart. Secondly, I'm going to call this the second reduction, is what I'm calling the lappers versus the kneelers. The lappers versus the kneelers. Verse 4 again. And the Lord said unto Gideon, There the people are yet too many. So he said, Bring them down into the water, I'll try them for thee there, and it shall be. Uh, that of whom I say unto them, this shall go with thee, they'll go, and, and so on. And then he says in verse number five, everyone that lappeth of the water with his tongue as a dog lappeth, him shalt thou set by himself. Likewise, he says, uh, everyone that boweth upon his knees to drink. So he says, you separate the ones that, that lap the water up with their tongue like a dog, and then you separate the ones that, that get on their knees and drink uh, from the water. And our Bible is very clear here that the number of them that lap, verse number six, putting their hand to their mouth were 300 men. But all the rest, he says, uh, of the people bowed upon their knees to drink. And so 10,000 go down to the water, and out of that 10,000, 9,700 of those warriors knelt down to drink, and God says, okay, they're out. I'm going to use the 300, and it's going to be by the 300 that I'm going to save you and deliver the Midianites into your hand. All right, so now we've got 300 lampers that are left, and that's the ones God's going to use. Now, there's, there's been a lot written, and you can look in the commentaries, and you can find all kinds of things about uh, the lampers versus the kneelers and, and the significance of all of that. But let me say right up front here that that everything that we read about uh, the significance of the lappers versus the kneelers uh, is just all conjecture. Uh, people say things like, well, you know, the lappers, uh, they were more vigilant as they drank than the kneelers. Uh, the lappers were more attentive. Uh, they were looking around as they drank while the kneelers uh, did not. Uh, they say the lappers kept their eyes on the enemy uh, and uh, the kneelers did not. But the only problem with that is the enemy, according to the, uh, the Bible, they, they were about four miles away, so they couldn't see the enemy to begin with. But people say, well, the reason God chose them, the 300, is because the lappers were more careful and the kneelers were careless. But I say again, anything that is said about either group, it's just all speculation because the Bible is totally silent as to why God chose the 300 versus all the kneelers. So any virtue 
or any qualities uh, that we apply to the lepers, uh, that's got to be read into the text because it simply is not there. You know, you know what I found out over the years? Uh, I found out when you preach the Bible in its context, uh, hey, that messes up a lot of preaching. I mean, a lot of things that make for good preaching uh, are not always uh, biblical. And this would be one of those cases. Uh, God is simply silent about the 300, why he chose them. Uh, uh, and, and so uh, he sends uh, 900, uh, 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 9,700 of them. Uh, they go home. Now we have 300. All right, so everybody wants to know the question, well, well why, why did God choose them then? If it wasn't anything to do with their virtue or their abilities or so on, why did God choose the 300? I'm glad the Bible tells us. Look in verse number two, where it's clear as a bell. And the Lord said unto Gideon, the people that are with thee are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands. Here's our answer. Lest Israel vault themselves against me, lift themselves up, saying, mine own hand has saved me. So you see the answer is given right here in verse number two. I like what one commentator said, the way he put it here. He said, verse number two, he said, it's got to eat its way into the grooves of our gray matter because verse number two is the very key to this whole section. So it's no mystery why God cut Gideon's army down to 300. God knows us. God knows the depravity of our minds. Even though we are saved, we have a depraved mind. He knows this. He knows that if he allowed Israel to go to battle in their full strength with all of their men, they would be puffed up. They would take the credit for the battle, and they would, they would take the credit for the victory, and God would be left out on the side. And so he says... Uh, lest Israel vault themselves against me, saying, Mine own hand has saved me. I, I, I believe verse number two speaks volumes to us. When we read that, I believe it re reveals to us our tendency as human beings to steal or rob the glory from God. I think all of us do that. Uh, we may not mean to, but I believe that, that we do that. We steal the praise and we steal the glory that belongs to God. Have you ever said this? Maybe uh, in conversation you, you've been in a struggle and you said, Hey man, I finally got the victory over so and so. Now think about the emphasis. It says, uh, you're saying, I got the victory. When it ought to be that God gave me the victory. You and I don't get anything unless God gives it to us. And so we put the emphasis on ourselves and when we do that, we steal the glory from God. I see it all the time in the modern day soul winners when they talk about how many they have won to the Lord. They take the credit. They steal the glory from that belongs to God. And we all, like I said, we all have a tendency to do that in our everyday lives. We try to take the credit. I, I learned something a few years ago from a preacher, if I named his name, nobody would know who he was. Very humble preacher, and I'd preach for him several times. And and uh, he said something that really stuck with me. And uh, and he was talking about when people get saved. When people get saved, he would always say it this way. He would say, "This is the one that the Lord has saved. This is the one that the Lord." Saved. He never said, said, this is the one that 
got saved while I was preaching. Uh, he never said, this is the one that I led to the Lord. He always put the emphasis on God. He said, this is the one that the Lord saved. And beloved, that's the way it ought to be. Uh, all the glory ought to belong uh, to God. In fact, God says in the book of Isaiah, I'll not give my glory uh, unto another. Uh, uh, the moment that you and I take credit for anything, uh, we become God robbers. Uh, we rob God of His glory, and we become worshipers, if you will, of our own works and deeds. I think we need to be reminded over and over again. We don't have anything that did not come from God. We don't do anything that God does not allow us to do. We are nothing. God is everything. And if we're going to glory in anything, then we ought to glory in the cross, not in ourselves, not what we do, but in God. And so there was nothing virtuous about the 300 that caused God to choose them. God just made the decision, that's who I'm going to choose. And I, I'd like to kind of apply this uh, uh, as a picture of salvation in that uh, there is no virtue in you and I whatsoever that would cause God to, to choose us or to save us. We are sinners, and the only way that we're saved is by the grace of Almighty God. You remember the verses, Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 makes it plain. For by grace are you saved through faith and that not of yourselves. It's a gift of God, not of works. Lest any man should what? Should boast. Listen, friends, uh, salvation is of the Lord. It's not of us. It's not of our works. It's not of our deeds. It's not of our methods. Salvation is of the Lord. And so the whole point of God reducing Gideon's army down to 300, it's not about the 300. It's about God so he can show himself strong on man's behalf. Oh, Matthew Henry said here of God's reduction in the numbers. He said that the Lord may at times, listen to this, deliberately weaken us or our churches and our ministries. Why does he do it? He says so that he gets the glory as we have to rely on him more. So I want you to see this morning that God is at work in Gideon's life. He is reducing the numbers of Gideon's army. Uh, he, he's doing that. He's taking away uh, any crutch that Gideon could lean on or trust on. Uh, and he, he's getting him to where he has only one option, uh, and that is to trust in the Lord and in the Lord alone. Del Ralph Davis writes, uh, he says, the necessity of weakness is often God's method in doing his work. The necessity of weakness is often God's method in doing his work. He said, which may explain why God uses the most unlikely of people to accomplish his will. Paul echoed those words, 1 Corinthians 1, 26, where he said, for you see your calling, brethren, how that not mighty, not my, uh, many wise men after the flesh, not many mighty, not many noble are called, but God had chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. God had chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty and the base things of the world and the things which are despised that God chosen Yea, and things which are not to bring to naught things that are, that are, listen to that, that no flesh should glory in his presence. God is reducing the numbers in Gideon's army so that no flesh could glory in his presence. I read this week about an old preacher by the name of William McCulloch. And William McCulloch was used uh, in revival in Scotland in 1740 or close by there. They said that he was a very scholarly pastor 
uh, who excelled in biblical languages, especially Hebrew, but they also said this about him. Said he had very little gift in the pulpit. In fact, they said he could, he could hardly even preach at all. And his son said this about him. He said, not my dad, he said he was not a very ready speaker. He was not eloquent. His manner was very slow and very cautious. In fact, in the reading, uh, when, when I was reading this, they actually gave a term that they applied to William McCulloch in his preaching. Uh, they called him the L preacher. The L preacher. And uh, they said that they called him that because when he would start preaching, uh, the people would get restless uh, and they would actually leave the service and go over to the, to the pub and, and quench their thirst with L. And so they called him the L preacher because he was so dry and so plain uh, and, and he wasn't anything to listen to. Yet, here's the thing. God used William McCulloch. Uh, he was chosen of God to prepare the way uh, for revival. And so why does God do that? I'll tell you why. Because God does not want any flesh to glory in his presence. Now, I, I know our, our time's gone. I'm going to leave you with just a couple of things here that I want you to think about. There's a couple of principles from our story I think are important and that is that before God can use us, I believe we see this, before God can ever use us, uh, we have to be broken uh, of self. And sometimes God has to sift us. He has to reduce us uh, until we're no longer dependent on ourselves. Uh, we're just dependent upon Him. So before God can use us, we have to be broken uh, of self. And, you know, it behooves us to ask ourselves the question, is there anything in my life that I know about that needs to be reduced so that God can use me? Here's the second thing. I believe our story teaches us that, that God in his might and his power, he can render a great victory with just a few people that are willing to depend upon him totally. There's no doubt when you read the story and God begins to strip away all the men from Gideon's army, uh, Gideon had, a, had an old zone uh, inadequacy, uh, and that's exactly the principle that God wants us to get. He wants us to get to the place that we realize uh, that without Him, we can do nothing. With Him, we can do all things, but without Him, beloved, uh, you and I can do absolutely nothing. And then I want to I want to leave you with this, and I want you just to think about this. May I say to you, when you find yourself in your own life, you find God reducing you, you find God uh, sifting you, you find God working in your life, and, and things maybe are going downward instead of upward, uh, I want to say instead of looking at that in the negative, uh, turn that around and realize this, uh, that when God is sifting you or God is reducing you, that is the very God of heaven in his love and in his wisdom doing a work in you so he can do a work through you. That's the reason God sifts. That's the reason that God reduces things in our life. It's such a hard concept for us to get a hold of, but, but God allows, and God even sends difficulty in our lives so that in our weakness, we can learn to depend upon God's strength in our lives. Paul said it this way again, God said it to him, my strength is made perfect in weakness. Don't despise those times in your life when God is sifting you, reducing you. Because just like Gideon, he's preparing us. He's doing a work in us so he can do a work through us. Father, thank you again for the word of God. 
Lord, may we look to you. May we lean to you. May we trust you. We thank you, Lord, for the message that you've given today through your word. May we be better servants. Lord, as we realize that our weaknesses are not to be shied away from, but it's to turn us to you. Thank you again, Lord, for your blessings now in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you.